Some functions, like this cosine wave, are symmetric. When you flip them over the y-axis, you get the same function graph. Other functions, like this sine wave, are anti-symmetric. When you flip them over the y-axis, you then also have to flip them over the x-axis before you get back the original graph. And then there are functions like the exponential, which are neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. It's easy to check whether a function is symmetric or not. When you start at x equals 0 and you walk to the right, you encounter exactly the same values as when you walk to the left. So the function value at any given x is the same as the value at negative x. For an anti-symmetric function, the value picks up a minus sign. Now here's a little surprise. Every function, no matter how non-symmetric, can always be split into a sum of a symmetric part and an anti-symmetric one. The first time I heard this, I thought, no, this must be a mistake. I mean, just look at the exponential function. I don't see any symmetry or anti-symmetry hiding in this graph at all. Well, it turns out to be extremely easy, actually. All you have to do is write the function like this. The first term is symmetric, as you can easily verify by replacing x with minus x. And it's equally easy to check that the second part is anti-symmetric. The sum of the two parts gives us back the original function. If we do this for the exponential function, we obtain the well-known hyperbolic sine and cosine, which is definitely cute. But what does all of this have to do with tensors? Well, remember that tensors are functions, so they can also be split into two parts. It's not exactly the same as for traditional real functions, but it's very similar. We won't talk about the symmetric part. We will focus instead on the anti-symmetric part, because it has so many interesting and useful properties that it's difficult to decide where to even begin. Well, okay, I guess we should begin with the simplest possible example. A one-form is a linear function from vectors to real numbers. When we glue two of them together, we get a bigger linear function. It's called a bilinear form, because it takes two vectors and still outputs a real number. The tensor product is a kind of strong glue that allows us to construct multilinear functions from smaller linear functions. Those multilinear functions are called tensors. In the previous video we had a list of requirements for them. Tensors have to be linear, and they have to produce a real number. Today we add a new requirement to the list. We are going to focus on anti-symmetric tensors. Those are a subset of all the tensors. They are still multilinear functions. But whenever you swap the order of two of its inputs, we want the sign of the output to flip. That is the only new thing we are adding today. This simple extra condition has many far-reaching consequences, as we will soon find out. First, I want to quickly convince you that this condition is not as weird as it may seem. Think about subtraction for a moment. When you swap the two inputs of the binary subtraction operator, the result flips to the opposite sign. Subtraction is anti-symmetric, and it always has been. You've been working with anti-symmetry since elementary school. Synonyms for anti-symmetric are anti-commutative and alternating. When we take two one-forms and we glue them together into an anti-symmetric or alternating function, we use this wedge symbol instead of the circled multiplication sign, and we call the operation the wedge product. It's important to keep the difference in mind between the tensor product, which produces a multilinear function without any further restrictions, and the wedge product, which always and only produces anti-symmetric multilinear functions. Okay, it's time for a concrete example. Start from a two-dimensional grid 
and think about the one form that extracts the x coordinate from its input vector. We talked about it before. It has vertical contour lines because the value of the x coordinate is obviously constant on those lines. Next, we take the one form that extracts the y coordinate from its input vector. It has horizontal contour lines. We already discovered that these two are the basis one forms from which all other one forms can be created as linear combinations. We call them the coordinate functions. I have given them the names alpha and beta, just like we did in an earlier video. We now glue them together using the wedge product. This creates a new, bigger function that takes two vectors as its inputs. The function is linear, but unlike the tensor product of alpha and beta, this one is anti-symmetric. What we want to do now is find out what this function does. Well, remember that we defined the anti-symmetric part of the exponential function like this. The wedge product is almost the same, except that it omits the 2 in the denominator. This is the official definition of the wedge product of two tensors. You will see in a moment that this is a really good definition, because it perfectly captures one of the most important concepts in linear algebra. So, dropping the 2 is a very sensible thing to do. We evaluate this function by giving it two input vectors. Let's call them u and v. In two dimensions, they are columns with two coordinates each. We will now calculate the real output. Let's first calculate the first term of our wedge product. It's a normal tensor that takes u and v as inputs. So we pass u to the alpha, the first one-form part of the tensor. It's a coordinate function, so it picks out the first coordinate of u. Then we pass v to beta, which picks out the second coordinate. A similar thing happens with the expression on the right. Let me know in the comments if you have problems working out the details. Now look at this end result. It's a real number, all right? But it also looks familiar, doesn't it? We have seen it before, many times. It's the determinant of a matrix that has u and v as its columns. In the series on linear algebra, we found out that the determinant measures areas. Here, specifically, it measures the area of the parallelogram between our two input vectors. This result generalizes to higher dimensions as well. Whenever you wedge a number of coordinate functions together, you get a new function that measures the area, or volume, or hypervolume, spanned between its input vectors. Isn't that incredible? Note that the area is indeed linear, as demanded by our requirements. For example, if you scale one of the vectors to twice its size, the area of the parallelogram also becomes twice as large. Linearity is still on our list of requirements. The fact that it's anti-symmetric doesn't change that. One consequence that anti-symmetry does have is that when you pass the same vector to the function twice, the result must be zero. You see, when you swap the two inputs, the result should pick up a minus sign. But because the two inputs are the same, the result should also be the same after swapping. So we need a real number that swaps its sign and remains the same. The only real number that can pull this off is zero. And guess what? That's exactly the area of a flat parallelogram between a vector and itself. So the area function works correctly because it's anti-symmetric. Here's another important consequence of anti-symmetry. When you swap the order of the two input vectors, the sides of the parallelogram, the sign of the area flips from positive to negative, or vice versa. This means that what we are measuring is not just the absolute value of the area, but also its sign, which tells us what the current orientation of the parallelogram is. This is going to play a central role in the series on geometric algebra, which is coming up next. 
You can already watch the first videos on Patreon, by the way. We are going to need the coordinate functions a lot more when we talk about integration later. To integrate a function of multiple variables over an area, we divide the area into small parallelograms, and then we add up the values of the function over all those little pieces. The wedge product is perfect for producing these pieces, and for calculating their areas. The anti-symmetry will take care of the orientation of the area, so that we know whether we are integrating clockwise or anti-clockwise. In one dimension, this means that the integral from A to B is the negative of the integral from B to A. So you see that even in calculus, the wedge product helps us make sense of things. And in that context, we will give the coordinate functions their true names. Not alpha and beta, but dx and dy. Yeah, that's right. They are those infinitesimal thingies that you always put at the end of an integral. The wedge product will allow us to finally understand exactly what those thingies are. But we still have many videos to go before we get there. And we can use your help. You can help our channel grow and reach more people by simply liking this video and subscribing to the channel. And if you have some money to spare, please set up an account on Patreon so that we can continue this journey through higher math. Many thanks, sincerely. So that was a lot of information about the wedge product of two dual vectors. Let's quickly look at the wedge product of two vectors. This is still an anti-symmetric linear function, and it takes two dual vectors as its input. But this time, it's much more interesting to take the other perspective and treat this wedge product as a passive geometric object. It's called a bivector, and it's often depicted as a small piece of a 2D plane. It lies in the same plane as the two original vectors, and its size is the area of the parallelogram between the two vectors. In the same way that a geometric vector, an arrow, is like an oriented line segment, bivectors are oriented plane segments. We can even wedge more than two vectors together to create oriented volume elements and higher dimensional hypervolume elements. This gives us a lot of new objects that we can play with. In 2D, you have two independent basis vectors, and you now also have a single basis bivector. All other bivectors are scalar multiples of it. And of course, we also still have the real numbers, which you can think of as geometric points on a one dimensional line. So in total, we have 1 plus 2 plus 1 is four different kinds of objects. You might consider creating a tri vector. But let me remind you that if you wedge a vector with itself, you will always get zero. In 2D, you will never be able to find three linearly independent vectors, by definition. And so any set of three vectors that you wedge together will always contain a duplicate. So you simply cannot create any tri vectors in 2D. We need more dimensions for that. In 3D, we have the reals, we have three independent basis vectors, and we have three independent basis bivectors as well. You just take all three combinations, x and y, y and z, and x and z. And now we also have a single basis tri vector, of which any piece of 3D volume is a scalar multiple. But this time, if you try to wedge four vectors together, Again, you will always have a duplicate, so the result will be zero. I used the word combination a moment ago. Each time you want to wedge k vectors together, you have to pick k out of the n basis vectors. That is, by definition, n choose k. As you can see, each dimension has its own line in the Pascal triangle, the table that lists all of the n choose k numbers. Since the sum of the numbers in a row is always a power of 2, we know that in n dimensions we can always construct 2 to the n linearly independent objects. 
We will play with these objects a lot more when doing geometric algebra next. One important property of the Pascal triangle is that it's symmetric around a vertical axis. In 3D, this means that there's an equal number of bivectors as vectors. In fact, whenever you have a plane or a bivector in your hands, you can easily produce a vector that's orthogonal to it and has the same size. This is often called the normal vector to the plane, and it can be a handy way of representing a piece of surface, including its area. The two dimensions of the bivector and the one dimension of its normal vector add up to three, so together they span the entire space. And likewise, whenever you have a vector in your hands, you can easily find its associated bivector. The fact that vectors and bivectors are complementing each other is known as Hodge duality. The thing about Hodge duality, though, is that it's confusing. It even manages to confuse trained mathematicians. In 3D, it tricks us into thinking that bivectors and vectors are the same thing, when they really, really aren't. Look, here's an example from classical mechanics. When you open a door, you pull the handle and the door swings open. You apply a force at a certain distance from the hinges. This causes a rotational force known as the torque. It's often written as the cross product between the force that you apply and the distance to the hinges. The result of the cross product is a vector that sits orthogonal to the plane of the two other vectors. But it behaves nothing like a traditional vector. If you look at the situation in a mirror, you will notice that the torque vector flips upside down. That is clearly not what an ordinary vector would do when you look at it in a mirror. This is why physicists call the torque a pseudo vector. But we can do better. The torque is calculated as a cross product. It's orthogonal to the two input vectors, and its size is exactly the area of the parallelogram between those vectors. So basically, it is the Hodge dual of the bivector, the wedge of the force vector and the distance to the hinges. And if you look again in the mirror, you will see that the bivector behaves in a perfectly sensible way. Its orientation simply changes from anti-clockwise to clockwise, which is exactly what you would expect a reflection to do. So it makes much more sense to think of the torque not as a vector or pseudo vector, but as a bivector. It turns out that there are many more places in physics and in math where these multivectors give us a much better picture, a deeper understanding, or just easier formulas and calculations. I know I went over bivectors and multivectors a bit quickly, but that's because they will come back in the next series, where they are the big stars of geometric algebra. Many of you have been eagerly awaiting that topic, and I'm happy to remind you that you can already watch the first geometric algebra videos on Patreon. I also left a few interesting links in the description. Do check them out. The Aleph Zero video in particular is very beautifully executed and gives a good idea of how the tensor product and the wedge product fit into a larger algebraic scheme. Thanks for liking and subscribing and I will see you in the next series.